Okay, welcome back to Nerdvine, where I'm behind by like a week, um, because Hanukkah actually started last Thursday, but I've been a little off, you know, life, the universe, everything. Anyway, Hanukkah this year, 2023, is December 7 to December 15, so I wanted to raise our glasses to the fascinating world of kosher wines. First, the disclaimer, I'm not Jewish. I don't claim to be Jewish, I don't have Jewish lineage. If I say anything wrong, please know I do so in the spirit of understanding and a desire for inclusivity and knowledge. Now, the first thing I needed to learn was, what exactly does kosher mean? So I knew it came from some guidelines given by the Torah, but other than that, like, hmm. Um, and sure, I know people I could have asked, but no, I went to the internet instead. So we found kosheralliance.org. I'll link it in the video description, and they seemed pretty legit. I mean, they had Hebrew writing in a section called Our Rabbi, right? No, I'm kidding. Um, but I just used the reliable source of my gut feeling. They seemed very genuine. So on the site, it says, kosher is a Hebrew word that means fit, proper, or correct. Okay, cool. Later, it says the word means clean or pure. But honestly, as a linguist and an avid semantic player, I am cool with giving multiple definitions for a word, especially when they're all so similar. So some initial guidelines, no mixing milk and meat products, no non-kosher animal products, kosher animals need to be slaughtered correctly. This may seem really easy essentially and initially, but let's not forget that the likelihood your wines are meat-free is actually low if you're counting insects as meat. Um, we'll get more into that when I do a video on vegan wines, but if you need to take a moment to come to terms with drinking a few crushed bugs, please pause the video, do whatever you need to do to help move past this. Additionally, when we talk about vegan wines, um, wow, well, honestly, after this video, we might not need to. But anyway, some additives for fining and filtering wines include gelatin, casein, and I think it's either isinglass or isinglass. I don't know, actually. Uh, I'll have to find out. Uh, so I was kidding about no vegan video. We will do a video where we talk about all of this. But in any case, kosher wines cannot use any of those additives for fining and filtration purposes because the ingredients are not kosher. I found a lot more really interesting stuff on the site, and I highly encourage you to check it out, regardless of your religious preference, just to understand some of the world around you. Um, but it didn't actually have a lot on wine. So off we go to Wine Spectator. I Again, I'll link the article in the video description. I'll just read you a quick snippet. Um, so, in order for wine to be deemed kosher, it must be made under the supervision of a rabbi. The wine must contain only kosher ingredients, including yeast and fining agents, and it must be processed using equipment rabbinically certified to make kosher wines. Pretty wild. Uh, no preservatives or artificial colors may be added. The wine can only be handled from the vine to the wine glass by Sabbath-observant Jews. That latter bit is super interesting to me right now because every WSET 3 session we talk about what are the decisions in the vineyard and what are the decisions in the winery. And here the winery part is so important, but for like religious and spiritual regions or reasons. So super cool. There's a little variation with uh, Mevushal wine, kosher wine specifically for Passover, Le Mahadrin kosher wine, which I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly, and of course, sacramental wine. Now, I think sacramental wine might be where kosher wines can sometimes have a bad rap. Looking at you, Manischewitz, there's nothing wrong with Manischewitz, but it, like many sacramental wines, including in other ceremonies and with other religions, can be a bit sticky, syrupy, sweet, rather than like a delicious dry wine. Um, again, no, no flack to the sweet wines, whatever, you get the point. For example, Yarden makes a dry, sparkling Blanc de Blanc that's kosher, and that's a little more my style, at any rate. Um, the Drapier Carte d'Or Brut that I had in another video also comes in a kosher version. I'll include links to a couple lists of kosher options in the video description. Lots of links this video. Now, if all that wasn't enough, keep in mind kosher wines coming from Israel have some extra guidelines. For example, the first three years' worth of grapes cannot be used in wine. And every seventh yard, the vineyard has to have a year off to rest. A nod to the Sabbath, of course. Also, 1% is typically poured away, like 1% of the total yield is poured away. I believe as a nod to tithes. I think there's more, but the point I'm slowly and laboriously getting to is that the reason kosher wines are sometimes just like an iota more expensive is because they have rigorous uh, viticulture and vinification practices. So, there's a little peek into the world of kosher wines. Um, I'm also including yet another link in the video description that talks about Hanuk Hanukkah, which I'm, yeah, I'm fairly certain, based on everything I've read, it's pronounced more like Hanukkah, but I'm not sure if it's more or less painful if I just accept my inability to pronounce it or if I try and I fail. 
In any case, grab a glass, l'chaim it up. Sorry, not sorry for that statement. And I'll see you next time for, I don't know, whatever episode we're doing now that I'm slightly off schedule. Cheers!